<sighs> hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another Q&A on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm going to pour myself a wee bit of Kiro Rye here for today. And we can get into our questions. As usual, this is uh, brought to you by the fine folks on Patreon who support Forgotten Weapons. Make sure that this channel continues to happen every day. Uh, and this is actually Q&A number 50. That's quite a lot of Q's and A's. Q and A's. So, um, I, as is kind of typical at this point, got a lot more questions than I was able to fit into a single Q&A video. So I'm actually going to go ahead and use a second batch of questions from this set for a second q and I'm not sure yet if it'll be later this month or if it'll be next month. But uh, with that aside, let's jump right in. Our first question is from KD, who says, what is the status of the Chinese Warlord period pistol book? Uh, obviously he asked this question, or she, I'm not sure, uh, asked this question before uh, I announced the launch of the Kickstarter for the Chinese Pistol Book uh, yesterday. So I am also filming this before the Kickstarter has launched. So when you are seeing this, it has already been going for a day and I have no idea how it's doing. So hopefully it's doing very well. I'm really excited about the book. Um, it is, uh, it's less of a sort of factual, that's a really bad way to put it. It is less of a detailed uh, historical, historical account than it is a catalog, um, a photographic catalog, but we're able to take a look at a couple hundred of uh, these Chinese mystery pistols, so to speak, and put them together into a book that I think is really fantastic and will really help people put these guns into context and understand on the one hand, understand what what's going on, what's what can be found in the context of Chinese domestic handguns of the Warlord era. On the other hand, it's also, I think, just a really cool book to flip through because no two examples of these pistols are the same and some of them are quite interesting and sometimes quite entertaining. Uh, so anyway, that Kickstarter will be running uh, for approximately 30 days. It will end in uh, I believe it is the 18th of June it ends. So if you're interested, definitely check it out. We've got some really cool stuff like the awesome Chinese mystery cover uh, of the book that I'm really happy to, uh, to have. Um, I know people are going to ask what the next project after that is for Headstamp. Um, I am hoping that it will be Max Popyanker's book on uh, the, the Avtomat, the Russian Avtomat, uh, Fedorov's through modern day AKs. Um, we're still working through some of the last bits of that book, but I'm hoping that that's the next one we'll be able to do uh, sort of our next cycle in probably about six months. Our second question is from Tyler. He says, I know that open bolt guns are inherently more inaccurate because of the human component, but are they more mechanically inaccurate? Or is it simply because of the bolt slamming forward and the user's reaction to this? As a side note, the FG42 would be a wonderful gun to test this with. It, it would be. Uh, if I had more access to an original select fire FG42, that would be a fun thing to try. Uh, however, I don't. Um, also, it's the sort of thing you would really need a ransom rest for to properly test uh, the accuracy of the gun in open bolt mode. Now, I can tell you that mechanically it's not, the, the open bolt systems mechanically are not necessarily any less accurate than closed bolt. It is. The difference in practical effectiveness of the two is due to the shooter's ability to react to and control the weight of the bolt slamming forward when they pull the trigger. Um, a good example of this would be, well, it's not strictly speaking true, uh, the mythology surrounding the Bren gun that it was too accurate to be a machine gun and it was used as a sniper rifle sometimes. Well, the Bren gun is open bolt, uh, it's open bolt only even in semi-auto. Uh, and so that's, I suppose, one piece of anecdotal evidence. But uh, no, the idea with the open bolt, open bolt self-loading locked breech guns is that they lock just the same way in open bolt mode that they do in closed bolt mode. They just then immediately fire. So mechanically speaking, no, no, no necessary reduction in accuracy just because it's open bolt. All right, our next question is from Andrew. It says, I would like to know if you think Mr. Johnson was inspired by the RSC. I don't think so. It's possible. What is more, more easily shown is that uh, John Garand was absolutely influenced by the RSC. And you can in fact see a lot of elements of the Garand in 
the RSC-1917. That was a rifle that U.S. Ordnance was aware of. The U.S. military, Aberdeen, Springfield, had examples of the gun. They tested them. They photographed them. They were well aware of them. And Garand copied a lot of, well, maybe not copied, but Garand was influenced by a lot of elements uh, from the RSC. The operating rod is an obvious one, the rotating bolt system. He, of course, made his own changes um, and improved on them for the M1, but there is an absolute undeniable link between the RSC and the M1 Garand. As for the Johnson, I don't see quite so much going on there. The Johnson is a recoil-operated gun. Um, the way that the bolt is set up is a bit different than in the RSC, so I can't. You, you can never say 100% that something didn't happen, that something wasn't influenced by something else, but uh, it is unlikely to me that there was much crossover from the RSC to the Johnson rifles. Uh, next question is from Craig who says, uh, how does military firearms development occur in totalitarian societies where free thought and speech are suppressed and criticism of the state is illegal or culturally unacceptable? I understand the point that Craig is trying to take here, but it's really just not accurate. Um, the fact of the matter is no matter how much suppression of individual freedom there is in a country, uh, the people who are working on military equipment for that country are yeah, like firearms design is apolitical. It's engineering. It is just numbers. Um, and I think there is, a, a, not to turn this into a political thing, but I think there is a, a common misconception that firearms development in the Soviet Union must have been far inferior to that in the U.S. because they didn't have the individual freedoms that are required for creativity and developing engineering systems. In reality, actually, the Soviet Union's firearms development system program, uh, like their general method of organization, had a lot of potential benefits that one would perhaps be wise to consider and perhaps adopt. The Soviets had uh, a number of competing design bureaus that would each independently come up with designs. They would have a chief engineer and a bunch of supporting assistants. Uh, and these, the names of these chief design engineers are fairly well-known names in the firearms community today. We have Degtrev, we have Sudayev, we have Kalashnikov, we have Fedorov. These guys aren't individuals working in a home shop. They're guys running major design bureaus at large factories. And the Soviet Union had a competitive system of developing firearms. They would put out a request for a particular gun, whether it's a new uh, whether it's the, the gun that became the AK, whether it's uh, the gun that became the PPS-43 or anything else, and they would get submissions from different design bureaus. Those would compete with each other. And then once one was chosen, it became a collaborative effort to, to improve and finalize and put that gun into production. So there was an interesting combination of competitive individual work and then collaborative group work that went into develop, firearms development in the Soviet Union. Um, we, of course, have some of that sort of thing in Western countries, but not really to the extent that you see it in the Soviet Union. So um, I think it's the political circumstances of a country don't necessarily do that much to influence firearms design, as long as the country itself, as long as the government is interested in having military arms designed, it can be done regardless of the, the type of society that it's being done in. Uh, that one 1911 guy asks, and this is a question that's come up in, the, in YouTube comments a lot, and I figured I should at least... I'll answer it here. Hopefully, maybe that'll get some more people familiar with it. Um, Ian, what is hashtag 36270s? Zero. It appears on like every third upload on YouTube. That is my P.O. box number. Uh, I have contact information in the video description of every video. It's in the like the default description text that uh, YouTube puts that I had, that I set up for YouTube to put into every video before I write description text. Uh, and it is a P.O. box, and so I put in the street number and the box number. Well, like a year, two years after I started doing that, YouTube decided to start recognizing hashtags and like highlighting them in video descriptions to sort of get on that bandwagon. And it interprets anything following a pound sign as a hashtag. So it's now looking at my address and just pulling out 
hashtag 36270. That's all it is. Uh, once I discovered what was happening with it, I changed the default upload setting so it no longer has the, the pound sign, so I don't think it's happening anymore. But I'm not going to go back and change the couple hundred videos because it's not that big a deal. But that is what that hashtag is. It's just part of my address that's now getting reinterpreted by YouTube. Uh, Tristan says, what are some modifications or designs that make a firearm more reliable in extreme cold or dusty desert or wet and steamy jungle? What are the pros and cons of these changes? And are there any developments for hardening firearms for extreme environments? So there are a number of specific uh, modifications or specific design uh, characteristics that I can point out that were done for specific environments. A good one, of course, are the sand cuts. Uh, as they were called on the FNFAL. There are a series of diagonal grooves cut in the side of the bolt carrier that are there to basically give sand a place to uh, accumulate and without actually impairing the firearm's functionality or reliability until the user has a chance to clean it. You see a similar sort of thing on the Sterling submachine gun. There's a set of um, uh, rotating uh, ridges on the bolt for that same reason, uh, enough to keep it in proper contact with the receiver, but give some space for gunk to get into. This is pretty similar to what we would have with black powder revolvers, where there are grooves in the cylinder axis pin to give black powder fouling a place to accumulate. That was, on those revolvers, it was done for black powder. On modern firearms, smokeless powder firearms, it's typically done in recognition of sand environments. Um, a good example of one for the jungle would be the Japanese use of chrome-lined barrels in the Type 99 Arasaka. The Japanese were fighting extensively in China, um, as well as a bunch of other places throughout the Asian Pacific realm. And uh, the ability, the, the chrome lining that they put in those barrels allowed them to be used in southern, jungly, very humid areas without needing the regular maintenance uh, and without actually corroding barrels. So, um, and did a great job. Japanese chrome-lined Arasaka bores are typically in excellent shape even today. By the way, they have Metford pattern rifling, so you will not see sharp grooves in the, the bore. That's how they were designed. Um, and does a really good job of it. Some of the, a lot of these things don't really have any downside. Um, those are the ones that come to mind offhand. Um, typically, a lot of uh, rough environments kind of impact guns the same way. Uh, you want to have uh, clearances that will, parts that will that interface such that they will continue to cycle reliably when they get stuff in them, whether that stuff is sand or dirt or powder fouling or snow or water. RGB says, if the M1 carbine was as reliable as the M1 Garand, would it have been a better general issue rifle moving the state of the art forward faster? I'm going to take a bit of a contrarian point on this question and suggest that perhaps the M1 carbine was a, um, a more influential rifle than the M1 Garand. I think in a lot of ways we see the M1 carbine staying in active military service in, in actual combat use longer than we see the M1 Garand there. The M1 carbine would remain popular with a huge number of different uh, organizations. Um, you know, the Italians had them, the French had them. The French in particular loved the M1 carbine, used it in Algeria, used it in Indochina, much more than they used the M1 Garand. Um, I think the reliability issues you get with the M1 carbine really did nothing to hold it back. And if they hadn't existed, I don't think it actually would have made the M1 carbine any more influential of a firearm. Mechanically speaking, the carbine and the Garand are very, very similar. They differ only in the details of the gas system, basically a long stroke piston versus a short stroke tappet style piston. And I don't think one is, if anything, the M1, the Garand is perhaps a better technological driver because it's operating at higher pressures. Uh, with a larger cartridge, doing essentially the same thing that the M1 carbine is, but the carbine is doing it on lower pressure cartridges, and thus it's easier to deal with. Uh, so, no, I don't think 
improving that last bit of reliability on the carbine would have had any substantial impact on it, how, how it affected firearms development. Eric says, have you considered doing more brewery or distillery tours, pairing the national alcohol with the historic firearms of a country? That would be cool, but it's, there's kind of a limited, um, there, there aren't that many options there. Con there aren't that many countries that both have distinctive national alcohol and also a substantial history of firearms manufacture. Some, certainly, but I have certainly considered doing more distillery tours in particular. The thing that holds me up on that a bit, aside from the fact that I have to travel, obviously, to do them, and travel has been a bit limited in the last year, year and a half, is that a lot of distilleries are pretty much the same. Uh, I've been to a couple Scotch distilleries, and the products are different. The products have different subtle characteristics, but the process of making them is essentially identical, with the exception of just a few you know, subtle differences. You know, if it's a Scotch distillery, do they use peat to dry the, the grain, or do they not? And that's not a particular, like if they don't use peat, they're using something else. Um, do they dry it on the floor or do they dry it in a tumbler? There's not that beyond that. Like, they all work the same way. If you saw the Kiro, the rye distillery tour, you pretty much saw a scotch distillery at the same time. That said, I won't turn down the opportunity to tour a few more, but um, I need to figure out ways to make them distinct and interesting as distillery tours if I'm going to publish them. And they will be... Future ones will probably be on Apocrypha, um, just for patrons. Uh, it was fun to do a couple of them uh, in public, uh, to, partly to remind people that Apocrypha is a thing, some behind-the-scenes video for patrons, and partly to get a little bit of publicity for those distilleries, but future ones are probably going to be less publicized, because they're not going to be that much different. Hunter says, which service revolver pre-1940 is your favorite? The Webley, perhaps the Swiss Waffenfabrik Bern? Um, with apologies to my French collection, I'm really a sucker for Webleys, especially the pre-military adoption Webleys. Stuff like the Webley WG Target, I think is just a really cool revolver. Uh, so, yeah. Webley, but not, not the, the Mark blank pattern of military Webleys. Those are cool and all, but there's, I think there's a little more character to some of the earlier ones. Let's see. Blaze says, besides a Sazerac, do you have any absinthe cocktails you enjoy? I've been trying to find some, but haven't had much luck with anything that isn't overwhelmingly with the anise flavor. I honestly don't really like absinthe. Um, I like some anise flavored stuff. I've got no problem with ouzo but I've just never found an absinthe that I liked. And I do also find that that flavor tends to predominate any cocktail that you put it in. I'm really not even a fan of the Sazerac because it's got too much of the absinthe flavor in it. And if it doesn't, then it's not really a Sazerac. So I can't really help you there. Uh, I, if anything, tend to avoid absinthe cocktails rather than search out good ones. Eric says, in watching your slow motion shooting of submachine guns, some seem to be not impacting the back of the receiver. The grease gun comes to mind. Are there any guns that accidentally benefit from constant recoil? No, not really. There's constant recoil is more than just the bolt not hitting the back of the receiver. There is also a, an element of timing in there, an element of bolt weight. And the idea that the force going forward and the force coming backwards are balancing each other out to the point that the gun isn't getting a lot of push in either direction. Uh, or a lot of, I should say, because it, it, it always will have push in the rearward direction because mass is leaving the gun going forward. What constant recoil does is instead of having a, call it like a sine wave of recoil impulse hitting the shooter, it smooths everything out. So you have a, essentially a constant force pushing back on you. With the submachine guns, yes, by not having the bolt impact the back of the receiver, you avoid the worst of the, the sort of jarring uh, recoil impact, but you're, you still have a lot of mass in the bolt coming back, typically on a simple blowback submachine gun, and the guns still have this rocking pattern to them, even if it's more easily controllable than on, say, a rifle uh, or a more compact submachine gun where the bolt's impacting the receiver. So they're getting a benefit, submachine guns that don't 
impact the receiver are getting a benefit in controllability, but that's not quite the same thing as constant recoil. Rebel Alliance Shooter says, is there a reason that most military forces prefer the notch sight like the AK or the Car 98 over the aperture sight? From what I've seen, only the British and Americans were using aperture sights early on, uh, and it would seem like they would have an advantage with quicker sight acquisition and longer sight radius. I would tend to agree. I would remind you the French also used aperture sights starting with the Moss 36, um, which is about when, well, the US started them a little bit earlier with the 1917. Uh, Enfields that we got from the British. Um, the British didn't start using them till World War II. There are pros and cons to them. It, it came to light when I was in Finland in the winter that uh, snow packing into an aperture site is actually a lot trickier and time consuming to clean out and make usable than snow getting into an open notch site. Uh, in fact, when I did some shooting in the snow with my M39 Mosin over there, and bloke on the range and chap on the range. Uh, we're doing the same thing with a Moss 36 and a number four Lee Enfield. And they had a lot of, when they got snow into that rear aperture site, it was time consuming and tricky for them to clear those apertures out. I actually had a couple of instances where the rear notch of the rifle was packed full of snow, but I could see enough over the top of the site and I could see the front site that I was able to make hits, not, not just you know, reasonably accurate shots, but I was actually able to make hits without having to clean the site out. And half the time the recoil popped the, the snow out of the site anyway. So there are in fact advantages to open notch sites. I would also point out that the Finns seriously considered going back to open notch sites in the 1970s um, on their RK-62 rifles. Um, those became the M71 pattern of Valmet commercial rifle. It was developed um, by the factory. The military decided not to adopt it, but they did sell them on the civilian market, and you'll see them out there from time to time. So uh, the open notch sights are simpler, uh, they are sometimes more rugged, and they uh, align themselves better to some designs of rifle, like bolt action rifles that have you know the rear of the receiver bridge open. Uh, it's harder, not impossible, but it's harder to mount an aperture sight back there. So Everything is pros and cons. I do agree that aperture sights tend to be better for precision shooting, um, but not everything in the military is about precision shooting. Uh, Ryan says, what is the biggest dead end in gun development? Something that seemed viable or, uh, even, or even was viable for a time, but ended up going nowhere long term. I thought about this and the best answer I can come up with, I think, would be either pin fire cartridges or the long recoil operating system. Uh, long recoil, so pin fire, of course, uh, seemed like a good idea because it gives you a nice metallic case. Uh, the primer's protected inside, but you've got this pin sticking out the side of the cartridge case. It has transportation issues. Uh, and of course, there's no way that it would ever have worked in a box magazine with this asymmetric pin sticking out. Uh, not too terrible in a revolver um, because you were able to use the pins, align the pins radially to the outside of the cylinder and then have the hammer hit on them without needing an opening in the back of the recoil shield. That's kind of cool. Ultimately, with the introduction of modern center fire priming, pin fire goes away very quickly. And then long recoil had some benefits early on. It was, it was a viable thing for a while. Uh, the main benefit is it's a very safe system, especially if you have risk of um, inconsistently loaded ammunition. With long recoil, you've got the barrel and the bolt traveling backwards while the cartridge is, while the bullet's flying out the barrel, they travel backwards locked together. So there is a lot of mass, which means inconsistency in ammo is going to have proportionately less effect on the velocity of the bolt and the barrel coming back. They're a little more tolerant of that sort of thing. Uh, and by the time the system unlocks, everything has recoiled all the way to its full extent of travel and pressure is really quite low. So it's a very safe system uh, in that way. The problem is it's also a very complicated system. You need an extra recoil spring for the barrel, which you don't need in a gas operated system. Uh, there tends to be a lot more friction because you've got this big chunk of mass recoiling back. And you'll see them used in like half a dozen total firearms. 
Now, some of those were manufactured in large numbers, and some of them were quite popular. The Browning Auto 5 shotgun is long recoil. The Winchester 1911 is long recoil. Um, obviously, the Remington Model 8 is basically John Browning took the Auto 5 and made it a rifle. And um, Well, not quite. Remington Model 8 is a long recoil John Browning system. Uh, and then, of course, the show shot. You know, the, the most common uh, automatic firearm of World War I is a long recoil system. But once you get past about 1920, uh, better systems become available. The gas operated and the short recoil operated systems really take over. And today there's really no good reason to have a long recoil system. You see them pop up every once in a while, uh, but really very rarely. Next up my place here. Uh, Erica says, you mentioned uh, not liking the HK rotating barrel aperture sights. What others do you dislike? What iron sights are your favorite? Kind of touched on this already. My favorite are uh, a good rear aperture sight. I really like the M1 Garand sights um, and all the guns that are along those lines. The 1917 Enfield M1917 rifles have fantastic sights. I really like those. Um, Frankly, the, the Finnish Galil, uh, the Israeli Valmet, or the, <laughs> the Finnish uh, Valmet, the Israeli Galil, I both, I like both of their sights because they're that same style of rear aperture. Uh, others that I don't like so much are really barley corn post and notch. If you've got a V notch and a, a, v, a barley corn V-shaped post, that's probably my least favorite of the, the really common sights. And I just don't like those HK drums. I think the issue with the HK drums, like I mentioned last time, is the, the rear sight is on this angled plane. It's not square to your eye, it's an angled plane, and it's a curved angled plane. And so I just never get a good sight picture through those. And the worst of them is the rear notch on the drum because it's way too close for a rear notch. I don't know how anyone can use that effectively, but I guess some people do. Uh, next up, Matthew says, do you know of any major power that has actually succeeded over a multi-year time frame at replacing three different primary weapons with a single do-it-all thing? Or is this just one of those ideas that always sounds great in principle, but has never actually worked in practice? I'm not aware of anyone that's been able to pull it off that I can think of uh, in a, a sort of three-for-one mode. Uh, the U.S. was planning to do that with the M14 to replace the grease gun, the Garand, and the BAR. That that didn't work. The places, really the only places that it's worked have been two furs where an intermediate caliber rifle replaced a, a rifle and a submachine gun. We see that with the British. Um, the L85 was of dubious effectiveness itself, but it did replace the Sterling and the FAL, um, the SLR in British parlance. The French did it very well, the FAMAS, replacing the MAS 4956 and the MAT 49. The French in some ways did it better than anyone else, or more effectively, in that they never actually went and made a carbine version of the FAMAS. Most of the other bullpup users decided to make a submachine gun out of their bullpup anyway. So you'll see like pistol caliber short versions of the AUG. There are short carbine versions of the L85. Uh, there are short carbine versions of the Israeli Tavor, but there never was one for the FAMAS. It did the job that it was asked to do, um, but it couldn't replace, like there isn't that third gun that you can effectively replace at the same time. Um, nothing that is handy and light enough to replace the submachine gun is going to have the volume of firepower necessary to replace a light machine gun. So the M14 was not going to be able to effectively replace the BAR. Um, the M15 version with a bipod and a pistol grip could have done a little better, but that got dropped from service really almost before it was adopted, well, basically before it was adopted. Um, yeah, no one, you just, the problem is the light machine gun and the submachine gun are too far apart in terms of what, the essential characteristics of the gun to be Done by to have both of their jobs done by the same single gun. Uh, next up, Martin says, I've seen in a few of your videos that the Navy has historically been more willing to adopt or trial new or experimental ideas. Any idea why this is? I think it's probably because navies typically have smaller requirements for small arms. 
and the small arms are a less substantial portion of the Navy's overall operating premise. When a naval force is looking for rifles and pistols and submachine guns, it's typically for a small contingent of boarding parties or landing forces. Because they don't need to buy as many, they're willing to consider perhaps technologies that cost more. They're also, um, naval landing parties are more likely to be just kind of by definition outnumbered. You don't have that many of them to work with. And sooner or later, they're going to end up in a fight against a numerically superior opponent. And between that and the fact that there aren't as many of them, uh, it's perhaps more viable to buy higher tech, more more fancy firearms for them. So this would come to light, I think, in repeating firearms. So given that my primary interest is French firearms, if you look at the French uh, Navy adopting magazine rifles before the army, it's because, well, hey, our colonial uh, Marines are going to be vastly outnumbered by uh, the native forces that they're fighting. We don't have that many of them. It's much more useful to us to have those guys equipped with eight round repeating tube fed guns than to have the line infantry companies where they can, you know, they, you've got a couple of ranks of guys, you got plenty of men, you can just, well, one rank's reloading, the next rank is firing. The, the repeating firearms don't give you as much comparative advantage as they do when you have a very limited number of Marines who need all the firepower they can get. Um, I think a similar thing, yeah, well, one of the other good examples of navies adopting something substantially different would be the U.S. Navy with the 6 millimeter Lee Navy cartridge and the straight pull Lee Navy rifles. You get the same sort of thing there. The idea was to give them a faster operating rifle, one that had a longer point blank range, better uh, barrier penetration, um, and there weren't that many of them. Um, so why not experiment with it, I think. Next up, we have Christopher, who says, which prototype firearm that you've handled was a tweak and a dollar away from being something really good? Uh, fairly recently, I had a chance to take a look at a gun that perfectly matches this description. It was in Finland. It was actually in uh, the Sako Factory's reference collection. They have an L34 Sampo uh, light machine gun, and it is a gun that was developed by Aimo Lati, who is like the one predominant firearms developer from Finland. Uh, he's better known, well, no one knows about the L34 because they only made something like 10 of them total. What he did design first was the Lati Saleranti light machine gun that was used by the Finns in the Winter War and was pretty much a catastrophe in field use uh, and was dropped basically as quickly as guys could capture Degturev DP-27 light machine guns. Well, Lati was required with the LS26, the Lati Celeranti, uh, to use a gas or to use a recoil operated system. And the idea was the Finnish military had been using the recoil operated Maxim guns for some time, and that worked great. And so, well, we want another machine gun. We like recoil operation, therefore, we will have our new machine gun recoil operated without the understanding of the differences between light and heavy guns and recognizing that a gas operated gun would be much superior for a light machine gun. Well, in the early 30s, uh, Lati put together a gas-operated gun that is, it looks very much like a Bren gun. It operates similarly to a Bren gun, but it's not quite a straight copy. And it is a gun that had something like half as many parts as the LS26. It was a lighter gun. It was a much simpler gun. It could have been a thoroughly successful, uh, very effective, magazine fed light machine gun to compete with guns like the Nambu and the Bren uh, or the, the ZB at the time. And it just never quite happened. Um, it was shot down pretty much for political reasons more than anything else. So in this case, the gun itself doesn't even really need any changes. Um, they developed it for a variety of different calibers, uh, 7.62 by 54 rimmed for the fins using LS26 magazines. Uh, they also developed it in, they built some prototypes in 8mm um, using, I don't know what magazine actually, the one I looked at the magazine was missing, but essentially a ZB26 magazine I expect. Uh, could have been a great gun for the Finns and for their, for Seiko, Sako to export uh, internationally, but politics never happened. They did actually test it after 
World War II and found that it was really pretty darn good. But at that point, they weren't looking for a box-fed full-power rifle cartridge machine gun. They were looking for a belt-fed intermediate gun instead. It's really good rye. I like it. Uh, Austin says, if you were designing a competition and stage for LMGs, what would that look like? I.e. focusing on suppressive fire instead of hits on target. Therein lies the problem. I have put some thought into this. I would love to do um, a competition involving light machine guns. Now that's a little tricky because you have to find enough people who have them in the same place at the same time to have a competition. But failing that, any sort of like standardized course of fire to assess light machine guns. And the problem that always comes up is, and this is particularly pertaining to competition, if you are on the clock, there's not much, you have to make the thing quantifiable. You have to make the, you have to have a quantifiable score in order to compete uh, effectively. And so you can quantify time, you can quantify hits. It's hard to quantify much else. And if it comes down to just making hits in the least amount of time possible, you almost always are best off in semi-automatic mode, which is realistic in some ways, but it doesn't, there, there is a, a very real benefit to full auto from a machine gun in real world scenarios where like suppressing fire is a thing. Well, how do you quantify suppression? And it might be a matter of having a large target and counting total hits on that target, but then what qualifies as effective. Um, you're going to run into things where maybe you require five or six hits on the target. Um, someone has to be confident in their own shooting to know when they've made those hits. If you're using steel targets instead of paper, it becomes very difficult for a judge to count rapid fire, you know, machine gun bursts. How many hits did that guy make? You know, he fired 10 rounds or he fired five rounds. Did he make three hits or four hits? Did he make six or seven? There are a lot of practical problems with trying to figure out how to assess that. Now, I did have a cool person send me a copy of a uh, U.S. military, uh, basically a trials standard for light machine gun or for machine guns, which I'm still working my way through. Um, some of this stuff, like, there are some elements that could simplify this, like having targets that automatically fall when they've been hit, because that that dictates your hits much more easily than putting a paper target at 500 meters and then assessing whether or not someone hit it. Maybe, you know, do you hike out to that target between every single competitor and retape it? If you had targets that just automatically fall when they've been hit, that helps, especially if they're electronic and you can hit a button and have them pop back up. But I don't know of any ranges that I have access to that have that sort of equipment that would be interested in putting on a match. So uh, it's something I'd like to do. I'm still thinking about if you have any pertinent thoughts on how best to assess light machine guns and their relative performance, let me know down in the comments because it'd be, I'd really like to put together something to do this. Uh, Guido has a question on revolver, revolving rifles and the Nagant seal. I'm a revolver fan. I've always liked the idea of a wheel gun carbine format as well. Um, the cylinder gap isn't great in general, and there's always a possibility of a hang fire that could go off, although it's never happened to me. Wouldn't a Nagant cylinder face to forcing cone in a better executed modernized form, maybe without the setback special ammo, address these issues, gases and hang fire risks with a rifle and make revolvers better in general? How come nobody has done a gas seal more often? So why has no one done gas seal more often? The answer is the ammunition. Because in order to actually have a, an effective gas seal, you have to have the brass cover that gap. Even the best mechanical seal isn't going to be gas tight. And the better the mechanical seal, the less gunk it takes to gum it up and make it not work anymore. So that's what makes the Nagant revolver special, is it's got extended brass that covers the gap between the cylinder and the barrel. And then the follow-on problem to that is you don't actually really gain that much. Uh, you gain a little bit of velocity because you're not losing it uh, right you know, to the cylinder gap, but it's kind of inconsequential. Uh, the, that little bit of velocity 
just doesn't matter. If you really need it, you can make the barrel a little bit longer and get the same benefit without having the added mechanical complexity and the unusual ammunition. As for why people don't do these in rifles, it's because really the only thing you gain is the neatness of it's a rifle with a revolving cylinder. Because if you want uh, just a convenient, handy rifle that holds a couple of rounds or even one round, there are lots of other systems that are mechanically far simpler and don't have any sort of cylinder gap issue to deal with at all. If you want a rifle that's got more ammunition, six, eight, ten rounds, box magazines just work better. Uh, people are more familiar with them. There's, they're going to weigh a lot less because you don't have ten, six, or eight, or ten pressure bearing chambers all simultaneously. You've only got one, and then you've got a box magazine that can be light sheet metal or an internal magazine that perhaps even removes weight from the gun uh, by having by being a hollow space inside the stock. You just don't get much of, of real economic value from a revolving rifle design. And so the market to be able to sell them is really quite limited. It's only people who want one because of the cool factor and that doesn't cut it for a company to really tool up and produce them. Alex, another Alex, uh, says, because of how far out you have to go to do your filming, have you ever looked at amateur radio for communications outside of cell range? No. Well, yes and no. <laughs> uh, I did actually have a ham radio license for a little while, like 15 years ago. Um, I was interested in it. I got set up to do it. I actually have most of the equipment. I got the license. At the time, though, I had I just then moved into an apartment that was really not conducive to setting up any sort of antenna. And I just kind of let the whole thing lapse and never really used it, even after going through the process to get the license. As far as using it while I'm out shooting, my shooting range is kind of out in the boonies, but it still has great cell service, so there's really no need to. Uh, Lubosch would like to know, why is there a myriad of 32 ACP pistols but only one submachine gun? That is because 32 ACP is today considered too lightweight of a cartridge to be a militarily viable cartridge. Uh, any submachine gun you can make in 32 ACP, you can do in 9 Parabellum just as well. Uh, there generally aren't the sort of size restrictions on submachine guns that would require you to scale down to a 32 auto cartridge. Uh, the one example you're talking about, I assume, is the Scorpion, which is really meant to be more of a PDW slash sidearm where there is a size constraint, and that's why it uses 32 auto. Uh, it doesn't help that 32 auto is a semi-rimmed cartridge, which makes it trickier to use in box magazines, especially double stack magazines. Not impossible, certainly. There are plenty of examples. The Scorpion magazines, uh, the Savage automatic pistols have a 10 round double stack magazine in them. But the cartridge isn't super conducive to it. Uh, frankly, if you wanted a 32 caliber uh, submachine gun, I would suggest 32 French Long, which the French made a submachine gun out of. Uh, you have more power, but you've got the same small diameter straight walled cartridge uh, without the semi rimmed case design. So, yeah, that's it. Because 32 auto means you're doing a PDW, not a true proper submachine gun. And PDWs today, people are looking for armor penetration, which means you want a higher velocity and a smaller diameter bullet, aka 4.6 by 30 or 5.7. Uh, by 28. The, the FMP90 or the MP7 are kind of the go-to PDWs. Paul says, I've become interested in the Pedersen rifle, but apart from your videos and articles and Hatcher's Book of the Garand, I can't find much else on the subject. Can you recommend a good book on the rifle and or Pedersen's other works and life? If not, could you lure an author to the offices of Headstamp Publishing with a trail of waxed 276 cartridges? Uh, we'll try that out. Unfortunately, I don't know of any good book on John Pedersen's work or the Pedersen rifle in particular. As you say, in Hatcher's Book of the Garand, there is probably the most discussion that there is anywhere. Several other books on the Garand, Bruce Canfield's book on the Garand, has some discussion of the Pedersen, um, but generally that's in the context of its competition with the M1. Um, finding, for example, information about the Japanese copy of the Pedersen is extremely difficult. There's almost nothing written about it. Maybe someday we'll get someone to do that book. Uh, there's certainly enough material to do a properly good book on John Pedersen. Uh, 
any guy who John Browning says is the best firearms designer he knows about, that's a guy worth writing a book about. But no one has yet. Uh, ben says, would you be willing to extensively photograph the guns you do videos on, ideally including a metric ruler, possibly selling the fo uh, photographs in bundles on Gumroad or to giving them to certain Patreon tiers? Uh, digital artists would be very interested in quality reference photographs, particular rare items or parts that are uncommon to see photographs of, typically things that require disassembly. I get this sort of co question, comment, request quite a lot. Usually it's more along the lines of disassembled photographs, um, or detail photographs for people to do digital models of, or 3D print parts from. The problem I have is that the time it would take to do that, it doesn't sound like much, but when I'm on the road filming, I'm typically doing four to six videos per day. And if I were to take the time to do this sort of photography, in addition to actually probably having to take a proper real still camera, which I don't actually own, um, it would probably double the amount of time required for processing through, shall we say, each gun. Uh, which means it's going to have the number of videos I can do. And the content is primarily video based. Um, that is what appeals to the most people and I think gives the most value for the amount of time that I put into it. And I just can't justify cutting the video production in half to do photographs. Um, I'm sorry, like I wish I could do all of it but it's just not feasible for me to do. Uh, maybe someday, maybe with some particular guns, uh, but at this point I, I, I just am not in a position where I can do that. I don't have a team that I work with, and frankly if I did have a team that would also severely restrict the amount of travel and the amount of work that we could get done. Scott says, what state do you think Western rifle design would be in if NATO adopted an intermediate cartridge instead of 762 by 51 in the 1950s. Do you think the near decade of clinging to the obsolescent concept of the full-powered rifle cartridge stunted Western rifle development, especially as numerous other countries waited much longer to adopt the 556? It is true that other countries waited longer than the US. Despite adopting 762 NATO in the 1950s, we ended up with the AR, which was basically a rifle that was around from the late 1950s. So it didn't really slow down American small arms development or American military equipment in that way. Um, I would also point out that kind of we did that cartridge well enough, despite, despite the time that was spent under 7.62 NATO, it was still the 5.56 cartridge that inspired the Soviet 5.45. Um, it, is, it was a cartridge that was leading the pack for a very long time, even though we weren't uh, even though we didn't, we weren't adopting an intermediate cartridge as quickly as the Soviet Union and its allies. Um, usually, the question is like, what if we had adopted something like the the British, you know, the the seven millimeter uh, British cartridges that are a little bit lower powered instead of full on seven six two NATO? I really think that regardless of what was adopted in the fifties today we would still be using 5.56 or some analog of it. 5.8 Chinese, 5.45 Soviet, 5.56 NATO. They're all pretty parallel. The idea of a small caliber high velocity bullet has really been shown to be the ideal individual rifle cartridge. So It's not necessarily the best machine gun cartridge and that's why we still see almost every country out there using a full power rifle cartridge for their uh, supporting machine guns, be they PKs uh, or uh, FM mags. But yeah, I don't think the NATO adoption really slowed us down much. John says, can you recommend a good, uh, uh, a good getting started book for someone interested in collecting Israeli weapons? Statehood through present mostly looks uh, like they used whatever they could get their hands on during the War of Independence. They did, but there's actually some really interesting stuff that the Israelis were developing on their own uh, during, like, right at 1948. They had their own copy, sort of modified copy of uh, the Johnson light machine gun, the drawer, and they had a number of other developmental guns that were pretty darn cool. And I would love to get to Israel at some point uh, and be able to film basically 
the developmental predecessors to the Uzi and the Galil, the other guns that the IDF tested, some of the other unusual stuff that was developed but not adopted, all that sort of stuff. Unfortunately, there is no good book on this subject at the present time, at least not in English. There might be one written in Hebrew that I'm not aware of. Um, the one book that is available in English is a was published a few years ago on the Uzi specifically. It's a very good book. Um, I'll have a link to it in the description text below. But it's specific to the Uzi, and it's less about the development than it is about the long-term, like the, the adoption and the use and the production of the Uzi. And it covers the use of the Uzi by countries other than Israel. The Germans used it, as did a bunch of other people. So again, uh, like a book on the Johnson, there just isn't, there's nothing out there that I can point you to, unfortunately. That's another one where if an author would like to write that book, has access to the guns and, you know, and the ability and time to do it, Headstamp would love to publish a book on Israeli small arms. That would be great. So if that's you, drop me a line in the comments, email us, uh, info at headstamppublishing.com. Toby has a bit of a long question. There, stock up here. All right. As you've covered before, the 8mm Labelle cartridge is the result of the quick development the cartridge was forced to go through. If the French used the early discovery of smokeless powder to instead uh, uh, get as much extra time into research, what do you think the resulting cartridge would have been? Also, seeing as the Labelle was the result of the same rushed development, with some extra time to wait as the cartridge was made, what do you think the eventual French rifle would have been? Do you think the French would have had a semi-auto rifle in World War I or World War II with a better cartridge? All right, so the biggest problem with the 8mm Labelle cartridge is that it is essentially 11mm gra neck down to 8mm, uh, which means it has a tremendous amount of taper. Now, it also has a rim. The question is, in 1886, is it realistic to think that anyone would have been developing a rimless cartridge? And the answer is, yeah, they could have, but there wasn't the obvious uh, rationale for it. Uh, a rimmed cartridge gives you this really cool benefit of being able to headspace off the rim, which is an easy, uh, that's easy for large scale production and quality control. Having a rimless cartridge means you have to headspace off the shoulder, typically the shoulder or maybe the neck, but the shoulder of the cartridge is what's generally used. That's harder uh, for mass production stuff. And I think before semi-automatic rifles were really a viable thing, there wasn't as much, there wasn't necessarily such an obvious reason to go with a rimless cartridge. So had the French had the, French had the foresight to go with a rimless cartridge, then I think there is a very good chance that they could have had a semi-auto rifle, at least in World War II, and quite possibly in World War I. They were developing, they had a bunch of semi-auto developmental rifles at the beginning of World War I. Uh, none of them were in a position to be adopted. Of course, they put something, they put a project into, um, into development, into rushed development that did give them the RSC 1917, uh, made in quantity during World War I, but it was significantly hindered by the cartridge, and that's why the, that cartridge is why they didn't have a semi-auto rifle ready in World War II, is because they couldn't take the RSC and just update it from rimless to, from rimmed to rimless ammunition, because there were so many sort of workarounds and kludges in the RSC design to accommodate this heavily tapered rimmed 8 Labelle cartridge that adapting it to 7.5 rimless that was developed in the 20s would, was not an efficient, effective thing to do. You really just had to scrap it and start from scratch, which is what they did on machine guns, which is why the show shot completely disappeared and gave way to the Chateau Leroux 2429. They were working on the rifle as well, but politics and money uh, prevented it from happening in time. Um, what would the rifle have? So, let me go back to the question. Um, if they had had the time to put in and the proper foresight, they basically would have developed something parallel to 8mm Mauser, 6.5 Swede, uh, 6.5 Japanese, 30-06, any one of those, well, not the Japanese because that was semi-rimmed, but they would have developed a full-power rimless cartridge case. If they'd had the foresight to do it in 65 or 7mm, so much the better. Um, even 8mm, 
think about France going into World War I with 8mm Mauser, they would have been in a much better position to be doing semi-auto rifle development. Uh, as for the rifle itself, we have a decent idea of what it would have been because we know what the French were considering uh, when the timeline was moved up. And I think the most likely thing that they would have ended up with was a Lee action rifle. Uh, essentially a, a French Lee Enfield. Uh, a Lee Saint-Étienne, perhaps? A Lee Moss rifle? Um, it was that detachable magazine bolt action system uh, that they were seriously considering. Like that was on the, the top of the short list. Going for, they, they went for the LaBelle because the time frame got shut down to about six months and the best they could do was taking an existing Kropacek style of gun they had and adapting it to a necked down 11 millimeter Gras cartridge. So I can see the French beating, essentially developing the Lee Metford really in a, a rimless French cartridge. And then I could see them maintaining that same rifle through World War II until they developed their first standard issue semi-auto, which is essentially what the British did. They took the Lee Enfield action and didn't change the basic action from the late 1880s until the 1950s. And the French could have done the same thing. Uh, it would have meant that they had a five or 10 round capacity rifle in World War I, uh, even through the end of World War I, instead of having to sort of cludge up a cavalry three round Berthier. Would this have been a fundamental, like, would it have changed the fortunes of war? No, probably not. Uh, not in World War I, not in World War II either. But it's an interesting thought experiment. All right, Travis says, would the PTRD be a good candidate for a small batch reproduction in 50 BMG? Its simplicity really keeps the production cost relatively low. There's a decent amount of interest in World War II Russian arms, and it would not currently fall under the NFA. All of those things are true, but my answer is no, it would not be, I don't think. Um, boy, I'm just giving all sorts of negative answers today, sorry. Uh, the problem is there is not enough of a market for reproduction, like there's not much market for reproduction firearms, period. Uh, you have to have a substantial demand for them to justify the cost of product design and development and tooling up. Guns, a gun will take five years to properly develop. And so any company that's willing to put five years of R&D money into a firearm, going like totally leveraging it because you can't make any money because uh, pre-selling is an idea that effective companies don't do. Uh, you can't make any money until you actually have the thing ready to go. And it had better be pretty darn perfect because the American firearms community is not willing to accept uh, much in the way of unreliability these days. Uh, you just, there are very, very few firearms that can demand, that have that much demand to justify production. There is very low demand for 50 BMG rifles today. Just look at how many of the regular ones, like the stuff that's out there, some of which is less expensive than you would be able to make a reproduction PTRD. Uh, they're still very expensive and they don't sell in all that much volume. The number of people who would take a PTRD, which is substantially uh, less convenient to have and to shoot and to use than a modern 50. Keep in mind the PTRD is about an eight foot long rifle. The thing is massive. Uh, Part of that is because it's chambered for a cartridge much larger than 50 BMG. These are chambered for 14.5 by what, 114, I think. Uh, a very powerful cartridge. Uh, but the guns, the, the barrel's huge. The gun's like eight feet long. You get logistical problems like, can you fit it in a car? Nobody makes a case that will fit a PTRD or a PTRS if you wanted to go really over the top and make those. Uh, and then company liability of making civilian 50 cal rifles that say people may shoot weird hot loads through. Um, the PTRD is not exactly a fail safe kind of gun either. Uh, in fact, it's deliberately designed to blow the bolt open on recoil every time you fire it. It's not a really liability friendly sort of design. No, there's just no market for it. Um, I can totally see 
an individual hobbyist spending a couple years and making one and loving it and people being very jealous of it and wanting them, but there are not enough people who want them to justify any commercial company producing them. I wish I was wrong. I would love to be proven wrong on that, but I don't think I am. And our last question is from Shane, who says, what are the most interesting delayed blowback mechanisms you have seen? And why do some 9mm PCCs have a delaying system when direct blowback is cheaper and works just fine? We'll start with that question. The reason that some 9mm PCCs use a delayed blowback system is because it makes the gun lighter and it makes recoil more pleasant. Um, undoubtedly so. The, the delayed blowback guns like the CMMGs, H and Ks, are noticeably nicer to shoot than the simple blowback PCCs. Uh, as for the most interesting delayed blowback mechanisms, the best one is an easy one for me, and that's a, a developmental gun that I filmed, oh, I think about a year ago, uh, that is like headspace stretching delayed, where the case, the cartridge case, is literally, the, the chamber is given deliberately long headspace and the cartridge case stretches when it fires, and that impact opens the gun. Um, that one is just kind of bonkers. Uh, beyond that, probably the next, the next one would be the ring delay, where you're expanding your cartridge case into an annular ring in the chamber. Uh, the Kimball pistols did it, as well as the MAN 1920-1921 little pocket pistols. Those are cool. Um, but delayed blowback is really one of the most fertile areas of firearms mechanism design. There are a lot of different sub-variations. So levers, rollers, gas systems, you know, gas delay systems, rotating barrels, uh, lots of neat stuff. But that headspace delayed is about the most unusual one that I think I've ever seen. So uh, that is all of our questions for today. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. Uh, if you didn't get your question into today's video, I am going to be using another batch of questions from the same request. Uh, for a second Q&A, like I said, I'm not sure exactly when. Uh, if you are a member of the Forgotten Weapons uh, Patreon page, thank you very much. Uh, when I am getting ready to do one of these videos, I put a request for questions on the Patreon page visible to you guys. So if you're wondering how to get a question in, that's how you do it. Uh, thanks for watching.